Can I get a mic or a mic and a half? That the source owe me. Shout out to the editor staff. Yeah, I'm all grown, so much better with math. I need a spread in the force, took the Benjamin Bath. Yeah, I'm serving this track like Steph Graff. Yeah, Roger Federer, there's no competitor. Urban Tennis, episode 15, the 2013 rundown. Welcome back, everyone, to the Urban Tennis Podcast. I'm your host, joined by my co-host. How do you do? Fantastic. On this week's podcast, we talk all things 2013. We look at the biggest stories, the biggest tournament wins, and the biggest misfortunes on tour. So if you're ready, let's get started. January to March. Well, the season starts in Australia. We had Bernard Tomic win his first title, but we had the Australian Open go to familiar faces. Novak Djokovic for the men for his third straight time, and Victoria Azarenka for her second straight time. But I think the more compelling fact was that Victoria Azarenka became one of the most hated players on tour this uh, year in Australia, and I think that is for the better, for the tour. So I'm going to bring in my co-host now. Why do you think Azarenka is so compelling to watch on and off the court? Well, I just think, it, you know, some people just carry themselves in a way that immediately makes them seem like they're not likable people. And Azarenka does that. I mean, you know, I'm going to admit something. I do watch professional wrestling. And then uh, she does give off that vibe as a professional wrestling bad guy that... She's above the people in the on the court. She's above her opponent. She's above the people watching her. She she gives that vibe that okay, she's gonna do whatever it takes to win, and she's only gonna win on her terms. She's not gonna win because she's a better player. She's gonna win because she's gonna win. And following that re- wrestling train of thought, she has the hoodie coming in. She has the music. She's like the boxer stepping in the ring. She's got the loud grunts. She's just a fascinating person to watch, whether you love her or you hate her, uh, she's become an interesting figure on tour, something that the WTA Tour is desperately needed. Okay, in February, Rafa Nadal made his long-awaited return after his knee injury that's kept him out for more than seven months, and then he goes on to lose in his first tournament to Horatio Sabalos. So, why were we so afraid of Nadal's comeback and that the fact that it would not go as well as it did? Uh, do we remember 2012? I mean, I swear, like, 70% of the articles produced by the tennis media were questioning whether Nadal would make it to 2014, which obviously he has now, but it was no guarantees that he was going to play anywhere close to the year that he had this year. So I think people had a very valid concerns uh, about Nadal uh, outside of his uh, stronghold on clay, how, how successful he's going to be. But I still think the overreaction to that first loss was really funny because, you know, we had to. We, 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 gave, we have to give Nadal, we should have given Nadal much more credit than we were giving him early on, saying that he was protecting himself on clay. But when he finally won in Indian Wells in March, I think a lot of people, you know, quieted down. But I think the more funnier part in this was, okay, sure, he had a terrible 2012 latter half of it, but the fact that people were jumping on him after his first tournament back, that to me was more critical of anything he did on the court in those first couple of tournaments. January to March also saw a breakthrough in Davis Cup when the Canadian team advanced to the quarterfinals for the first time, defeating a depleted Spain team. For podcasters and bloggers in this country, it was maybe one of the few moments that tennis can captivate the national headlines. Just tell me briefly what the Davis Cup team meant to Canadian tennis this year. It was tennis this year, pretty much. That may sound like a hyperbole, but that that's what the tennis year felt like. It felt like we were, it felt like we were waiting for each and every step up that ladder, just like those great promos we saw here on Canadian Sports Station Sportsnet. That uh, this. Canadian pro- that not only were we progressing throughout the year up this tur- tournament, but we were progressing as a tennis program and a tennis nation. Yeah, and I think the fact that Canadians did so well uh, on home court uh, later in the year at the Rogers Cup just uh, punctuated the point that this program had arrived and that the fact that these networks were giving so much attention to the Davis Cup team was justly deserved in the scope of 
the national and global tennis scene. Okay, so those were the most significant events of January to March. April to June. In April to June, we saw a few different things happen, or maybe more of the same. First of all, we saw Novak beat Nadal in Monte Carlo. And then after that, we, we saw Rafa and Roger meet for the 30th time in their, in their careers at, at the Rome Masters. And to cap it off, we saw Serena Williams and Rafa Nadal win the French Open. Now I'm, I'm going to tell, I'm going to step back and talk about Serena Williams. This is Serena, this is only Serena Williams, uh, only, quote unquote, second French Open title. Do you think this title is her most important? I think in the context of her career post-2011 um, and uh, those career-ending or career-threatening injuries, definitely. Um, this is the tournament that I think she was highly motivated to win. Um, a lot of people felt that if you wanted to get Serena, you had to get her out on clay in the French Open. Um, I think she knows that to be remembered in the great halls of history, she'd have to do something more on clay. And to win twice and to join those elite, that elite crowd that has won every slam at least twice, I think this can definitely be argued as her most important slam uh, win in at least the last five years. Yeah, because did, did she lose in the first round in the 2012 French Open? Yes, she did to Virgin Rosano. So just the fact that that happened um, and to do it this year, it's an incredible turnaround. Yeah, just... Pretty much a turnaround, just like we saw on the men's side with Nadal this year. I, mean, I think we already touched upon that, right? Yeah, I think anybody who was worried early on, by the time the French Open rolled around and you saw Nadal return to his perch, winning the eight, for the eighth time, um, set the tables at, yeah, no, he was back. Uh, whatever you were worried about, don't worry about that. And what he went on to do later on in the year, I think just, you know put that ceiling he had and he you know blew that ceiling out of the out of the out of the world. But more of an interesting storyline was that Novak Djokovic in the semis this year in French actually pushed Nadal uh to nine seven in the fifth. There was a chance that he actually could have won. So do you actually think that Novak Rafa on clay is the surface you'd like to see them play more on and the one you want them to play on more going forward into twenty fourteen? Oh, yeah. I think especially I'm really, really, really want to see a rematch in 2014. I mean, I think Nadal won, but Nadal had the match 50.1% and Novak was 49.9%. I think it was that close on margin that uh, Nadal beat Novak that on that uh, French Open tournament semifinal. So I'm really looking forward to see if uh, Novak can come in next year and hopefully facing Nadal at his best and maybe can actually knock Nadal off at the French Open and not just do the quote-unquote solderling. Yeah, just for the fact that the chance he has to knock him off on clay, you know, we've seen Novak beat Rafa on grass, on hard courts, whether it be on the, the carpet or the slower style to the North American ones. Just the fact that he hasn't done it in five cents makes that this surface the more compelling surface, I think, between the two uh, going forward. All right, and that was April to June of 2013. July to September. July starts off with the wackiest and most unpredictable Wimbledon ever. High seats fall. Andy Murray wins the men's side. The women's side is won by Marianne Bartoli. So bringing in my co-host again. Do you think Wimbledon this year was the most unpredictable slam you've ever seen? Yes, especially coming out of the French Open. We looked like we were having Nadal a tough form. This is, and this was still Federer's tournament. He, was, he still was a defending champion. Let's not forget that. And you had Novak probably playing some of the, still playing some of the best tennis of his career. And yet, after all that, we finally saw something else. Something else probably even more historic. And I'm going to let you finish this point. Exactly. And on the women's side, you had Serena Williams bringing so much momentum in. You had Sharapova, you had Azarenka. No, no one even survives into the second week, really. And then you had Ren, uh, Agneska Redwanska with a chance. You had Sabine Lazicki who became the favorite. And eventually, Marion Bartoli, who would famously retire just only a few weeks later, captured that title. So the ladies' side was incredibly 
incredibly challenged and incredibly like acted like a roller coaster. You just did not know when that story would end. But on the men's side, it sort of became a little more familiar and a little more predictable when we had Djokovic versus Murray in the finals. And then after 77 years, Andy Murray from Dunblane, Scotland, um, basically took the monkey off the tennis back, British tennis back, winning Wimbledon. Um, it was a huge story in the tennis world, but did the Andy Murray victory matter beyond the confines of tennis this year? I think uh, without a doubt, how can you not say it, it mattered with, beyond the confines of tennis? I think you saw a lot of people who... Uh, may only tune in just for maybe Wimbledon every two years, every three years, they were, they were tuned in and they were, they were excited by the results of this matchup. Yeah. And let alone the UK audiences were record breaking, but I was paying attention more to the year end list and the Andy Murray victory was coming up a lot in the top five sporting moments, the top 10 sporting moments. So it was a moment that I think resonated across the sports sphere. It caught um, national global headlines it was a moment that tennis doesn't get a lot, uh, but I think this year it was rightly deserved with Andy Murray's win. Um, moving on, we had a North American hardcourt season by Rafael Nadal that many will not forget. Uh, coming off his early loss in Wimbledon, he went to Montreal, won. Went to Cincinnati, won. Went to New York and won. And basically cemented himself as the number one player in the world, he would gain that title officially in October, but something of a modern miracle coming back from injury. So I want to beg to put the question out there. Was this the most impressive hardcourt season or hardcourt play you've ever seen from Rafa Nadal? Or was there a mix of conditions or favorable matchups that led to these results? I think I have to say it's most impressive from Nadal. I mean, Nadal has been long, long, not only has he not been his best surface on hardcore but he's long been critical of hardcore so you always kind of a lot of guys coming in a lot of times he felt coming into tournament he wasn't gonna give the best effort he could even if he probably should because he felt like it's not gonna be his surface anyway so he felt like he, he felt like this is this surface belonged to Novak. felt like the surface belonged to federer more than it did to him but i think this year he turned the tide completely yeah, I remember writing after Cincinnati win that I was really, really shocked that he'd been so consistent over those two weeks. Those two weeks in August are very difficult. The conditions are difficult. The type of play is difficult. The transition between balls, uh, between the Canada tournament and the Cincinnati tournament is incredibly difficult. But he was on top form for both those weeks, something that I've never seen him do. Uh, Cincinnati, he's been famous for really never showing up and never playing well. So that was a good sign. And then in in New York, um, he did enough. Like, he had some down moments um, in some matches he had, but he was aggressive. He was closer to the baseline. Um, he looked more and more like somebody who could, you know, play on hard courts for the rest of the year and not that typical, you know, run-down guy who... When it gets to September, he's basically a shell of himself. So in that way, it was the most impressive physical hardcore season I think he's ever had. Um, sure, he never had maybe the toughest matchups uh, in some of those tournaments, but it was still an incredibly physical performance that Nadal did. And also in the U.S. Open this year, Serena Williams winning her 17th title. Now just only one shy of Everett and Navratilova and within reach of Steffi Graf. Those were the moments of July to September. October to December. The Asian swing captivates both tours. All the players travel east. Um, we have Novak going a little streak. Uh, we have Serena Williams playing incredibly well, winning the WTA Tour Finals in Istanbul. So I want to ask, Serena Williams was 78-4 and four this year. Only won two slams, but do you think this is her best year ever? I'm going to say yes. I think the main uh, stumbling block you can say to the argument is that was the competition really there this year? Didn't Because it felt like nobody else was really breaking out and trying to get to that spot to challenge Serena Williams. I think the closest you came was 
Azarenka in the in her in the U.S. Open final against Serena Williams, where she did push Serena to three sets, uh, but it wasn't it wasn't like the most competitive match. I think it was more like a a sixty forty match, sixty percent in favor of Serena Williams. Yeah, I can make the argument that it was her best ever because of the consistency. You know, she's famous for having those letdowns in the smaller tournaments. But it seemed every tournament she entered this year, she intended to win it, and she almost did. Um, the fact that she did lose a couple of times in the slams, that's natural. Um, Sabine Lazicki would have been a difficult out anyway at Wimbledon. But I think in terms of year-to-year start to finish, her best year ever, Maybe not as good as a Serena Slam year where she really peaked at every slam. But from start to finish, you can make an argument, and I think I am, that this was her best year ever. Now, Novak Djokovic in November won his third ATP World Tour Finals, beating Rafa Nadal. Uh, He was incredibly good uh, to close the season, uh, winning in Paris, uh, winning in Shanghai, um, and then winning in London. Does that make him the early favor in your mind to regain his position as the best player in the world in 2014? I think so. I mean, uh, you can see a lot of times how a guy finishes the season does. I think it does translate to how he starts the season. And if you start the season winning off the Australian Open, you're probably going to be number one pretty soon. Yeah, I think so. I think he's. Uh, definitely needs a, a really good start to the year, and he usually does that. But I think the key is going to be how he plays in that June and Ju- June and July stretch. He's had one great year that he's done it, but then other years he kind of fades in that June and July stretch. But I would definitely say that right now, I would think if somebody wins multiple slams next year, I'm going to pick Novak Djokovic to do it. Um, the year ends in December uh, with a lot of coaching changes, both on the ladies' side and the men's side. And we'll see those ramifications uh, take shape in 2014 with Becker coming in, Chang coming in, Paul Anacone coming in. Okay, so those were the events of October to December. We're nearing the end of this edition of Inside the um, uh, Urban Tennis Podcast. <laughs> and uh, as always, we like to end with our social media highlight. And this will almost take the form of our social media highlight of the year. And I'm going to bring in my co-host who's going to introduce it. All right. This is a late addition to the social media highlight of the year. Uh, it came out on a post from December 18th from Andre Agassi's Facebook page. And it's just a beautiful piece of prose. Uh, I'm going to start it right now. It's pretty long, so bear with me. But I think you'll like it. If you want to hear it in Andre Agassi's voice, probably read it on his Facebook page. But if you want to hear it in my voice, keep listening. All right. It starts like... It's no accident. I think that tennis uses the language of life. Advantage, service, faults, break, love. The basic elements of tennis are those of everyday existence. Because every match is a life in miniature. Even the structure of tennis, the way the pieces fit inside one, one another, like Russian nesting dolls, mimics the structure of our days. Points become, day, points become games, become sets, become tournaments, and it's all so tightly connected that any point can become a turning point. It reminds me of the way the, the seconds become minutes, become hours, and any hour can be our finest or darkest. It's our choice. That was a really, really incredible piece of uh, writing by Andre Agassi. So definitely check that out on his Facebook post, and I want to thank my co-host for reading that. Uh, like always, you can catch the podcast on um, SoundCloud, on our YouTube page, on backrowsports.com. And like always, thanks for listening. Episode 15, the 2013 Rundown.